Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is Mr. Miller once again, and this is uh, Tuesday the, the 2nd of June. Tuesday the 2nd of June. Uh, we are entering into today our final day of notes. Uh, so that's kind of a, a, kind of a momentous occasion, you might say. Uh, but our final day of notes here. So we are going to wrap up topic 19 and 20, and then uh, Wednesday and Thursday we will have a crossword on 19 and 20. And then Friday's a catch-up day, and then I sent an email regarding next week with the review slash help sessions that uh, you can optionally attend. Uh, so I'll send another email either at the end of this week or beginning of next week uh, outlining that a little bit further. But the email that I sent yesterday, you should read that in full uh, and make sense of it. So um, we have, like I said, our final day of notes here. So uh we have had a long ride together and this is the last one so uh buckle up i would say so uh we left off with uh number 16 okay number 16 so we uh got through number 15 which is talking about uh barack obama being elected and then his economic reforms uh and so kind of how he decides to tackle the great recession as they call it the great recession so um Let's talk a little bit about his domestic agenda. What is he doing here in America? Uh, what sorts of policies is he, or what sorts of, yeah, what sorts of policies is he advocating for? So let's start with healthcare, because that's kind of his major, major accomplishment here. Most people would, uh, would argue. Uh, he pushes through a policy or a, a law that is called the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but we give it the nickname, and it takes the nickname Obamacare. Uh, for the longest time, Barack Obama did not refer to it as Obamacare. That was just kind of a nickname that everybody gave it. Uh, but he did eventually refer to it as Obamacare. Um, so it's kind of interchangeable. Now most people know it as Obamacare. So Obamacare, it is a basically a federal law that says, uh, it says a bunch of different things, but uh, kind of the main pieces that we remember it for is that it number one makes it so that everybody in America gets health insurance or has to have health insurance you don't get health insurance for free that does not happen uh, at least not yet uh, maybe in the near future who knows but uh, at this point you don't get health insurance for free you have to pay for it but this is a government mandate saying that every American in the in the country every American obviously uh, has to purchase health care has to buy health care uh, there was like 30 some million Americans who did not have health insurance. So Barack Obama viewed that as something that needed to change. So he fights for uh, fights for health care to be kind of uh, mandated uh, requirement. So this is uh, kind of controversial because if somebody, let's say, uh, does not want health care, let's say that they do not get sick and they don't they don't have any conditions that force them to go to the doctor so much. Uh, and they'd be getting health care for really nothing, uh, they would uh, ha either have to get health care, buy it, or they would get fined. Uh, so they would get fined for uh, not purchasing health care. So, uh, like I said, kind of controversial in that sense. So you might say, oh, well, who is, who is that sort of person? Well, so somebody who's younger, somebody who doesn't go to the doctor, somebody who's not sick, somebody who's pretty healthy and doesn't have any reason, uh, reason to go to the doctor. So those sorts of people would have, uh, would have costs taken out of their paycheck every other week. Uh, otherwise they would just pay or they would, they would never use that. So what they do is they just take the fine and the fine turns out to be less than uh, the cost that healthcare would cost them uh, if they were to purchase it and not use it. So those are the sorts of people. Now, uh, like I said, very controversial. Uh, this costs American businesses. Uh, the main group of people who had to pick up the slack uh, was business owners. Uh, business owners all of a sudden had to pay for people's health insurance or large percentages of people's health insurance. Uh, the remainder of which would be picked up by uh, picked up by the individual. Uh, but businesses have issues. Uh, there are also uh, requirements about pre-existing conditions. What that means 
is let's say that you have cancer, but you lose your job. Then you start a new job, and then uh, what would happen is previously the employer's health insurance corporation would be able to say, uh, we don't want to bring you on uh, into our health insurance because uh, those people who have, who have these pre-existing conditions and are probably pretty sick, uh, they are more expensive to insure. They are going to cost more than the normal person who's not going to go to the doctor more than once a year. So those are pre-existing conditions and those are uh, something that a lot of health insurance companies would avoid, uh, avoid like the plague. Uh, but this uh, this Obamacare ends up uh, kind of changing that and making it so that they have to accept people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, and that's probably one of the best parts about this law, at least in most people's opinions, is that uh, the pre-existing conditions rule um, is, is probably pretty good. Now, Barack Obama also faces opposition uh, to a group of the Republican Party, a side of the Republican Party. When Obamacare gets pushed through, uh, it sparks a lot of negative feelings towards Democrats, obviously. Uh, so it gets pushed through in, I want to say, December of 2009. Uh, it was finally passed. Um, yeah, either 2009 or 2010. But um, I, remember, I remember waking up. It was Christmas Eve. This is going to sound really nerdy. But I woke up on Christmas Eve and they were having a vote in the Senate at 6 a.m. on Christmas Eve to pass Obamacare. And then it was going to the president to sign later that day. So I, I woke up. I watched the Senate vote. Don't worry. C-SPAN 2 had my back. So, uh, yeah, I watched it. So all of this talk about Obamacare, it's not a popular thing among Republicans. It very much divides the country. So Republicans, there's a group of Republicans who get very, very upset about this, uh, upset about these uh, programs. So this is kind of a conservative rise here in 2010, uh, and they call it, uh, let me go back here, they call it the Tea Party, okay, the Tea Party. Um, the Tea Party is actually technically an acronym. Uh, you can see it here as this wolf, which I'll talk about in a second, the Tea Party. Uh, they call it the taxed enough already, taxed enough already, T-E-A. So they say, oh, we're already taxed enough. We don't need to add these government programs on and add Obamacare on there. And that's going to make us be taxed a lot more. So we don't want that. Now, uh, the Tea Party was very vocal and uh, criticized big government all around I uh, criticized uh, large, uh, I guess, large government spending, uh, viewed that as out of control. And so it's this big movement to try to get government back under control. It has been spiraling out for a long time, and our national debt has been going crazy and all that stuff. So that comes from, uh, that comes from the, uh, the right side, the conservative side. Now you can see here a rally that happens in Washington, D.C. Government spending out of control. Don't believe the liberal media. Okay, we've heard these things before. Um, now this here shows, uh, this political cartoon shows that the Tea Party is like this hungry wolf. And this here is described as the GOP establishment, the Republican establishment. Meaning the Republicans who are not part of the Tea Party uh, might also face the, uh, the bad feelings of the Tea Party. Uh, they're pictured here as running or walking around with stakes on them attached to their body. Uh, so the hungry wolf will obviously turn on them too. Uh, so nobody was safe. Democrats, uh, traditional Republicans, or more moderate Republicans, and the Tea Party is kind of uh, fighting back against all these people. Now, uh, there are some issues at home as well that I got to mention. Uh, there were the Boston Marathon bombings, which happened in 2013, which you hopefully know about or at least heard about. Um, there's a terrorist, a domestic terrorist attack there, or not a domestic, eh, I don't remember. Uh, it's a terrorist attack in Boston at the end of the marathon uh, in April of 2013. Uh, then you also have a bunch of government shutdowns, which was not really that common of an occurrence, a super common occurrence. I mean, it happened, but it didn't really happen. Basically, how it goes is uh, the government, uh, Congress passes a law that says we will, we will spend this much money from now till uh, X, till whatever date they pick. Usually, it's like the end of the month. So like September 30th, we're going to fund the government through September 30th. 
Uh, and then from there, we'll have to make a decision or pass another funding bill uh, that then will give money uh, going forward. So there were number there were a number of times when people who were upset about the spending uh, decided that they were going to shut down the government and say, nope, we're not going to allow for uh, the government to function. So uh, non-essential workers get laid off and things like that. Uh, the longest government shutdown that happened was just a year and a half ago under Donald Trump in uh, 2018 over Christmas to 2019. It was shut down for like 40 some days, uh, the government was. Now, technically, they still go and they still meet and the government still does its essential duties, but all the extras are done uh, until the government opens back up. So there were a number of those over the course of Obama's administration, a number of those shutdowns. Now, uh, allow us to move on to number 17. So uh, let's talk about the war in Iraq first, okay? And then we'll talk about Afghanistan. So the war in Iraq, uh, there were 4,000 Americans who died in Iraq in total. Uh, and so we get out of Iraq in 2011, uh, pretty, much, uh, pretty much completely. I mean, we had left some people there to oversee the Iraqis. Uh, we had, um, uh, usually our, our main goal in these countries are to go in, stabilize the country, and then train others who are normally from that country, natives uh, from the country, uh, to then maintain whatever stability we have brought. So that is uh, what we were trying to do. So we said, okay, we're getting out of here. We didn't like that we were in Iraq. And one of the big, the big issues with uh, Barack or with the, or, uh, George W. Bush was that we stayed in Iraq and we stayed in Iraq and there was no reason for us to be there because they didn't find any of those weapons of mass destruction that he was looking for. So he gets out of Iraq in 2011, uh, Barack Obama does. Uh, he leaves 50,000 troops behind to support, uh, support the Iraqis. Uh, and then what ends up happening, interestingly enough, is when we step out of Iraq, uh, the Iraqis were not strong enough at that point uh, to maintain the peace that we had created. So there is another group that rises up, uh, and that group uh, we have heard of, definitely should have heard of this one called ISIS. Okay, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria is what it stands for. So ISIS is uh, kind of comes into power in 2014, 2015 is when they really start uh, ramping up their control. And it's just this militant group uh, that's uh, trying to create a separate, uh, separate Islamic government in Iraq and Syria. And they don't really go by the territorial boundaries, uh, but it is uh, kind of just a sign that we left too soon because then what do we have to do? We have to go back into Iraq afterwards. And uh, at this point, we basically kicked ISIS completely out uh, under uh, the most recent few years, uh, the past few years. But um, yeah, we probably, this is, this is not really history that I like to dive into, but it's what they call revisionist history, meaning that uh, Oh, shoulda, woulda, coulda. If you shoulda, you shoulda done this. It would have been so much better. Uh, so I don't usually like to go there because you make decisions in the moment, and it's not helpful to go back and look. Uh, it's not that helpful to go back and look four years later and say, "Hmm, I shoulda done that," because you can't go back and change it. So, but looking back at this point, okay, probably shouldn't have left so soon in Iraq. It was not entirely stable. Anyways, uh, again, like I said, I don't like to dive into that so much. Uh, next here uh, is Afghanistan. So Obama ends up increasing the military in Afghanistan. Uh, there are still the main two groups that are there. Uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban are still active in Afghanistan at this point uh, in Obama's term in office. Uh, and so they invade or they add more troops to Afghanistan uh, under, under Barack Obama. Uh, that leads to Osama bin Laden being uh, hunted and killed, and he was actually in Pakistan at the time, but uh, he was uh, taken out in that, uh, I guess, I don't know what it would be called, an operation, sure, an operation uh, with uh, SEAL Team 6, and they went in, 
stormed his compound and, and shot him and killed him. So uh, that was in 2011, uh, spring of 2011. Now, um, also, uh, many Americans also start to get upset by the fact that Barack Obama was trying to remove troops, but he actually added troops to Afghanistan. So they get upset with that. They say, wait a second, you were supposed to bring us home, bring our boys home, uh, bring our men and women who are fighting for us home. Uh, so that is kind of the the feeling that a lot of Americans are having at this point. And what does he do? He increases the uh, increases the uh, what you would call it the involvement in those areas. Uh, so that is kind of shown here uh, in this uh, political cartoon. It says exit plan, please. I'm no George W. Bush because George W. Bush talked about exit plans, having the exit plan from Iraq and from Afghanistan. And so it says, now leaving Iraq, welcome to Afghanistan. So he's basically just moving all of the troops from Iraq over here to Afghanistan. So uh, that part is a little questionable. This gets the nickname as Obama's Vietnam or Vietnam 2.0 uh, because Vietnam was a situation where uh, the president, Richard Nixon, was elected to try to bring our, bring our troops home from Vietnam. And what does he do? He actually invades and sends more troops to Vietnam. So that part is uh, kind of interesting. Now, uh, Obama eventually ends up pulling a majority of the troops out of Afghanistan by late 2014. However, to this day, we still have troops in Afghanistan. And we're trying to negotiate a peaceful uh, peace deal with, guess who? The Taliban. Okay, and that is what's happening legitimately, which I find interesting because 10 years ago we hated the Taliban and we really disliked them. But I think we're recognizing that we can't have a stable situation in Afghanistan without the Taliban being involved because we're never going to kick them out completely. So I don't know. It just feels weird because now we're working with the people that we were trying to kick out to begin with. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Anyways. Uh, let's move on to number 18, our last notes slide of the year, uh, which is a very interesting, uh, very interesting moment here. Uh, and kind of a sad moment, if I might say so myself. We spent a good number of days on this stuff, and now we're, we're done. So uh, we are at number 18, looking to the future, okay? Uh, we are not at the point yet where we can call what's happening with uh, Donald Trump and him being president as history. Uh, I would argue that you can't really get a good feel for uh, history until uh, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, so we're just starting to shape the history of the 1980s and 1990s currently. So with all that being said, we can't really get into Donald Trump too much because that's current events at this point. Now, uh, looking to the future, what are, we, what are we looking at here? What sorts of issues are we gonna have to face uh, going forward. Uh, well, interestingly enough, we are moving forward with, uh, I guess, into a world with uh, seemingly fewer barriers, okay, uh, which is interesting if you know anything about world affairs. We are kind of working on barriers and trying to build those barriers up. But as a general trend, our country is, is kind of moving away from, from physical barriers and country barriers and trying to make more of a interconnected society. So by that I mean uh, we have programs that, uh, that are put in place. Uh, one of them, the North American Free Trade Agreement called NAFTA. Uh, NAFTA was put in place under Bill Clinton. Uh, that actually just got replaced uh, with the uh, USMCA agreement, the US-Mexico and Canada agreement, USMCA. Yeah, uh, so this is just a free trade, basically saying we're going to work together with Mexico and Canada, our two neighbors. Uh, we're going to work together with them to be able to um, to be able to kind of organize our trade a little bit better and uh, not kill each other and not fight each other over trade. We're going to organize things a little bit better. But uh, we do have <clears throat> questions about uh, trading with other countries. So part of the reason why we revised uh, NAFTA or kicked it out or part of the reason why Donald Trump got rid of it and negotiated a new plan is because uh, NAFTA was very nice towards Canada and Mexico but not very nice to America. That meaning uh, we didn't have as profitable of trade 
uh, between this uh, underneath this program as these other two countries did. We kind of got taken advantage of in our trade. So that was one of the reasons why uh, we got this renegotiated. Also look at the big issue that's happening with China. Tariffs in China and they are uh, America is worried that China is taking advantage of us in our economy. They are producing a lot of goods and they are taxing goods. Uh, when they go over to China, they're taxing American goods through the roof. But when Chinese goods come over to America, we're letting them come for free. So that's a consideration at least. I'm not saying that it's a big concern. Uh, it, it is a big concern depending on your political affiliation, but I'm saying it's a consideration, meaning that uh, without disclosing my official opinion on it, I'm saying that, you know, uh, it's something at least worth thinking about, uh, and it's something that we are thinking about as a country. Now, uh, we are also moving to an interconnected society which uh, gives us kind of, uh, in part of this computer age or whatever computer age, uh, it gives us kind of an interesting, an interesting moment here because uh, we have a lot of areas where we can learn a lot of things very, very quickly. Uh, data collection, uh, the government can harvest information very fast and it's really no issue to them at all. So at what rate do we worry about our information falling into the wrong hands? Okay, Facebook apparently, you know, gives info to Russians or something like that, you know, or uh, info that's on Facebook goes to the Russians. So it's like, okay, at what rate do we worry about that a little bit? Uh, at what rate do we, at what rate does our interconnected society compromise our safety as a whole society? So that's an interesting thing to at least think about. So uh, cybersecurity happens to be a massively growing field in the early 21st century uh, because everybody wants to protect your data uh, or everybody wants their data protected and there needs to be people who can do that and people who can find people who are unable to, uh, unable to follow those rules. So they need to hunt those people down. So cybersecurity, if you're thinking about a career, that's a very fast growing career uh, in America. So, um, that's the end, okay? That's all I got for you. So, uh, tomorrow we're going to have the crossword. So, we're not done done yet, but that's the last notes day. So, uh, we have now completed, uh, completed the notes. So, I will uh, have them posted on this video as well, or with this video in Google Classroom. And if you could also go into... Uh, into that, uh, those essential questions and answer those. Uh, and there will be two essential questions to answer. And those are the last ones that we've got to do for the whole year. So um, yeah, just do them and then be done with it. <coughs> okay. I think that's all I've got. I will sign off there. Again, uh, read my email if you haven't already from yesterday. Uh, shoot me an email if nothing or if something in there doesn't make sense or if you've got a question or anything. Uh, otherwise, uh, I will be back here again tomorrow to talk about the crossword, and then we'll go forward from there. Until then, I will sign off and see you, see you later. See you later. Bye.